All right, Outlaw Radio Live fans, we are live on the air with the legendary Layla Steinberg. How you doing tonight? I'm good, thank you. So I have to ask, uh, what made you decide to get into the music industry? <laughs> That's how you're going to start, huh? <laughs> I am pretty sure it's a pretty I'm... long story. <laughs> I guess that's what we're talking about. I didn't decide. It decided. I I never wanted to be in the industry or the business of music. I'm an artist first. I think um, our artists are um, our most important leadership and our most important teachers. And music was always sanctuary for me. It's um, where we could just be connected to all people. And um, and find some salvation. So I always resonated with the arts. And what decided my entry to the industry was Tupac. He um, he thought I would be good at the business, and he actually discovered me more than I discovered him. And he bought every book that he possibly could, and he taught me how to do business for him. So that's my entry into music business is my oh, I, young teacher. I actually did not know that. <laughs> I know most people don't. The narrative reads, white lady discovers Tupac. <laughs> but neither of those are quite accurate. Um, but, you know, we, we don't um, get stories unless we tell our own, and so I guess that's why I'm starting to speak a little bit more. I'm getting older, so I feel like I owe my testimony to those that made a difference to me in my life, so um, Tupac thought I would uh, be a great vehicle, and he um, basically challenged me to use my privilege and my whiteness to help him have access and get in doors that he needed to get in. And I loved him and believed in him, so I I did, even though I didn't want to. Um, and that's how it started. I have to ask this one. This was the next question on my list. Um, I don't know. I'd, since you said, like, Tupac helped pretty much got you in the industry, I don't know if this question would be accurate then. Um, but I read in the, in the late 80s that you performed as a backup dancer and touring with the Nigerian All-Stars. If that is true, how did you get linked up with them? I had a dance company. Um, I was always a dancer. I grew up in Los Angeles. And um, when I was young, I lived um, in an area that was predominantly black. And I loved black music and black churches and black people. And I was so blessed to grow up and be exposed to such incredibly gifted um, music and an amazing community. And so when I was a kid, I used to dance at somewhere called Inner City Cultural Center. And there were a lot of African drummers and musicians that came. And then later on, I did every kind of dance I possibly could. And I was in other companies. And I started my own around a couple of years before I started working with Tupac at a dance company with another woman. And so um, OJ Ekamode and the Nigerian All-Stars performed in a club in the Bay Area. He's known as the father of world beat music. And we opened for him. And at the time, he was touring and he was doing a lot of work um, in the anti-apartheid movement. And he asked if I ever considered being in a band. And I had been in bands before, but never an African band. And so I basically auditioned. He asked me to come to a rehearsal. And I definitely was not um, the most talented member of the group, but I had a strong voice. And he felt like I could be really um, valuable, especially speaking to people that look like me about issues that needs to be dealt with. So I, um, for two reasons that was important. One was to be um, a voice, and, and I loved his music. But the other thing is the reality um, in this country still to this day is when you're traveling with a band that's 
mostly black, um, and you're traveling through the South and East and the Midwest, there are a lot of people who are really racist. And it was good to have me go and get rooms at hotels, interface with promoters. And so I also began to learn about the business, helping with the band. And um, they spent a lifetime utilizing my privilege and my whiteness to um, to address issues and make a difference to my family and my loved ones. So that's um, <laughs> that's the band stuff. But yeah, I I definitely spent some years on the road with Orlando Julius, who is um, in his 80s now and coming to do one more tour. I think they're they're coming to the U.S. soon. Maybe I'm going to get on the stage with them a few times. We're working on um, there's a show in New York and some Bay Area shows. So it'd be a nice reunion. That would be a yeah. Actually, Tupac. Tupac freestyled with the band in the um, in '89. He um, he got on stage at the Redwood Theater with um, with the band. Somebody has that on tape somewhere. Oh, nice! That's actually pretty cool. It's, it's weird. Um, no matter, uh, there's so many tapes of Pac still coming out. It's like it's it, it, it's insane. Like there's stuff that I've I've been a talk fan my whole life, and I still come across things every now and then that I've haven't seen before. Yeah, I think they're gonna keep coming. Um. So also, while you were living in the San Francisco Bay Area, you held poetry classes in Oakland. Um. What made you decide to start those classes? Um. It wasn't really that I started poetry classes. I um, I was a young mother who knew that we had two educational systems, one for people who grow up in poverty and another for people who grow up in privilege. And if I could rewrite our educational script, one of the first things I would include is emotional education and financial education. And so I felt like there were so many issues we don't address in education that I wanted to find a way to tackle subjects that we we don't address. And so I felt like if I could get a group of artists together and give topics for everyone to write about, I could begin to bring a new agenda into education. And I would do it through assemblies and school tours. Additionally, I wanted to be able to market rap artists in the early days when we weren't even acknowledging rap as an art form. So I did an audition and asked for writers, poets, singers, dancers, anybody that wanted to come be part of my workshop a couple days a week. And then we would take the material that we created and we would incorporate it in assemblies and do school tours. So that's how it really started as a young collective of writers. And um, and that was the beginning of the microphone sessions. And it was really about cultivating voices that could have impact and help change the world. And Ray Love and Jacinta and a, a lot of young artists from the Bay Area were in my first group. And Tupac joined us six months in. And before he ever was on a record, him and Ray Love were like the high school kings. They did all my school assemblies with me. And, um, yeah, it was the, the early days. And I still do workshops 30-something years later. I'm still doing the same thing. And I have to ask, this is the one question when I, when I, when I, when I first heard about you years and years ago. Um, I always wanted to know, um, when Tupac first walked in, to like those sessions, that class. Um, what, did he stand out to you? Like, what was your first thought when you saw Tupac? Well, I didn't meet him in my class. I actually, um, I had been hearing about him from people, and he had been hearing about me. And we actually met at a club. I didn't even know he was Tupac, but he danced with all of us on the dance floor. And then I recognized him the next day. I was teaching in Marin City, and I saw him, and we began to talk and realized that we were both the people that had hear, been hearing about one another. And I shared with him what I was doing and 
what I wanted to do in the schools and basically brought him home and introduced him to my family and we were inseparable from that point on. He came to workshop, he um, took it over, he wondered why I was the one who came up with all the topics and taught me um, a lot about leadership and what it is to not have a hierarchical a hierarchy in, in leadership and that we could do it collectively and we could take turns picking the topics and um, yeah I, I kind of shifted my my whole style so he he came in as a peer and and really added a lot to our whole circle we were just a circle I was a little older but probably although I was older than the group I might have been younger in a lot of ways and I was 25 you know with with kids already so I was a young mother with big dreams and a big vision and he matched and exceeded mine so we all learned from one another and and worked together we were like a family and I have to ask this um on one of the de uh, deleted scenes of the All Eyes on Me movie shows Tupac talking to your character in the movie about how he wants to join the new African Panthers rather than continue to pursue his music. Was that a true story, or was that just a Hollywood kind of thing? Well, what happened was he wanted a record deal quickly. He was in a, a real hurry. He um, didn't know how much time he had, and... Because um, black men have been endangered in this country for, from day one, he felt like he was endangered and he wouldn't live past 25. So he was very desperate to make things happen fast. And um, he basically, I had introduced him to Atrium by then and to Shock G, and we really were working on getting his record and his deal together. But um, he gave us an ultimatum, and he said if he didn't have his project done and, and we couldn't make it happen fast, he was moving to Tennessee and, and really um, joining the leadership of the new African Panthers. But even though he didn't end up going, he definitely had a role. He worked with Chokwe Lumumba and, you know, spread the knowledge and, and was very committed to his activism. I would say before Black Lives Matter was an organized movement, he was the poster child for Black Lives Matter because all he ever wanted was black lives to matter as much as everybody else matters. And, and black lives haven't mattered in this country. And that was really, um, that's who he was and what he was about. And I have to ask, um, with that movie, um, were you happy with how your character was portrayed? I really don't think my character was portrayed. I, I think that it's going to take a long time. Tupac is such a deep story and a deep character. And there's you know, my, I have my own story, and so I think that in most of the documentaries and the films, I, I mentioned because my role was significant, but I don't think that we've seen the story or, or my role, or you would know that Tupac discovered me more than I discovered him. I was an insecure 25 year old artist who um, wanted to make a difference in the world but didn't even think I could like be in business or run a business let alone manage an artist I'd never known anybody in the business I didn't have role models hip-hop was brand new and I was you know the only woman in most circles when I was working and so I am um, I'm thankful that he believed in me and I believed in him. Um, and as far as the movie goes, it's so complicated because we have to um, to answer to an estate. And an estate is a business. And the business of the estate 
is to um, not necessarily to tell the truth, but to maintain um, business and and to market and promote and and so I don't think that we take in consideration all the different people and the roles they played and and so I think there's two different things there and you know it's on me that I haven't told my own story so you know if you don't use your own voice other people use it for you and that's why I'm doing this interview and I'm speaking more because I'm going to be 58 in a week and I um, better start getting my voice out as much as possible because there are so many people besides me who played very significant roles in Tupac's life and many other lives and in this business and their stories are important and, and we don't see it so I don't want to knock the movie it's it's not the story I would have told. But I think any story that sheds light on his brilliance opens more doors to hear more stories. So, kind of how I feel. It's it's understandable. I, I, I when I watched the movie, I I saw a couple flaws in it too. Um, but I look at it as Hollywood, and unfortunately, you can't get everything perfect with with Hollywood. So. I mean, they did what they could with everything they were dealing with, and it was a Tupac story, and and they could only touch on little bits. It was kind of like, um, you know, they have 90 minutes to tell 25 years, and, and he was a very complicated man with um, a lot, um, a lot of different pieces to his story, and they'll still be telling stories long after we're all gone. And the one the one question, the last pop question I have uh, for myself, um, uh, you did the Thug Angel uh, documentary. I have to ask, what was it like doing that documentary? That's personally one of my favorites because it really does go in depth that more, more than Resurrection. It was cathartic. It was a way to deal with my pain. It was awesome to work with Tracy and with Quincy and Casey and Peter Spire. There were five of us that produced it together. It was a lot of Tracy and my footage that went into it. And, um, you know, I think we were so traumatized losing him. We were all in denial. He had been shot before. He was shot on Tracy's birthday. So I don't think any of us that was to him really believed that he wouldn't make it. And even though I didn't manage Pac after 93, stayed very close to him. And so I think that we were so in shock that, um, that it took a while to realize he was gone. And meanwhile, there were other people that were not as emotionally affected and they went and took over the business and ran with it and did a disservice to his legacy for sure. But um, those of us that were still grieving, I think it gave us an opportunity to come together and pay tribute to our friend. And and so that really was what Thug Angel was for me. It was a tribute to a young man who I love dearly, who I miss every day and who I think had one of the most important voices of my generation. And, you know, many years from now, we'll look to his voice to understand my era and to understand this country and to look at at, and have a deeper examination of race and inequity and law and justice. And his voice is very important for that. And I hope that people... Um, continue to spread his voice and continue to listen because he's a vehicle for a deeper conversation and he had a huge heart and he wasn't perfect you know he fucked up a lot too and so sometimes we put people on a pedestal and we forget they're human beings that hurt and that make mistakes and have their own issues and 
I would hope that we could become more humane and um, and really, you know, have some forgiveness and and embrace people with their flaws. Any example of that? You are also the founder of Aim for the Heart. Um, what's that organization about, and how and how can people become more involved? So, Aim for the Heart is a nonprofit that I started in the '90s, and it's basically um, an organization that houses my curriculum. And you know, my my work that outside of management is really to help us become emotionally and financially literate. I think that we're in a world of broken-hearted people. Um, very few people don't have a broken family. And I want to see people begin to understand their feelings. Everything is heart-related, whether it's how you spend money, how you learn, whatever it is, it, it always starts with the heart. The mind follows the heart. If you get a kid's heart, you can take them anywhere. And so I believe that if we learn to understand the geography of our emotions, we can better manage our pain and manage our feelings and, and function in the world differently. And so anywhere that there's kids that I can touch or have an impact on or help them to understand the mind and heart connection, that's my primary work. And so, you know, we have a website, email, my name at Gmail. Um, you know, I'm on Instagram. That's how you found me. And I respond as much as I can. I'm one person, but I do care. And I was really surprised I want to see us heal. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the other thing is that People don't realize that the people you want to reach are accessible. And it's the person like you that's not afraid to reach out that oftentimes, you know, you land what you're looking for. And so I would encourage people to reach out, to, um, to know that you can access people, that, you know, we're all just people. Also, I saw on your Instagram when you reshared the poster that I made for our interview, and you asked your fans um, what they wanted to know, and I handpicked a few uh, of those for like our listeners and for your fans to uh, to know. So, the first one is Tony Rico five six zero wants to know: uh, Did Tupac ever guess uh, second guess himself on his career? Second guess himself all the time. We all do. Um... There are times that he felt he made choices and things he would have done differently. There were things that hurt, that broke his heart. There was the whole charge he got caught up in. And he, um, I don't know if second guess is the right word, but if he had it to do again, there's a lot of people he would not have dealt with. There are things he said that at times he wished he could have taken back. There were events he went to that he wished he didn't go to, and, and that's all of us. But hindsight is, you know, it's the lesson. You can't take it back, and time is all we have until we're not here. So it's part of the process. Um, also, OC Outlaws uh, wants to know, in your opinion, what do you think Tupac would be doing in 2020 if he was still with us today? He would have expanded his political voice. If he wasn't running for office, he would be um, sharing space with somebody who was. He would be campaigning for changes in policy. He would be fighting to abolish the prison industry. He would be on the front lines of Black Lives Matter. Um, and he would be doing art always whatever that art is, whether he was directing films or writing, but he really left a body of work for us because he knew he wouldn't be here and he spoke it into existence. So I think there's an important lesson in listening to people when they tell you something. 
And um, I think we were all too young back then to know the difference and and to intercept his thought process and ask him to stop speaking his death into existence, you know? That's part of the tragedy. Um, also, Rod Fryer wants to know, uh, he says, I would like to hear your thoughts on being a relatively young female, managing, guiding, supporting the careers of some of the most influential artists. Um, I remember a confident young lady that had an infamous era around you. Uh, please share what the, these folks saw in you that gave them the confidence you, that you were one. They saw my heart. That's probably one of the qualities that I like about myself. I have a lot of qualities I don't like about myself, but I really, um, I have a big heart. I really care. And I had a front row seat to injustice at a very young age, and I knew something was wrong with the world. And I approached working with artists like a parent. I believe it's a huge responsibility to work for young, gifted talent. And I took it seriously, and it mattered to me. And I care about people's lives. I, I don't care about the money. And so I haven't always made the best decisions, but the people that work with me know I do what I do because I love them. I don't do it for a paycheck. And there were many times I didn't even want to take money. It was really spiritual work. And so I think those were the things that resonated, that I even when I was too young to be a mother figure, I wasn't a mother figure to people that were five and seven years younger than me, but I thought I was. And so I treated everybody like I was their mother. I have a big mother complex. And um, and they knew that they could trust me, and I think that's something that really matters. It's hard to find people you can trust, and I would never do anything to violate um, the artist who I, I loved and believed in. And um, I put them first. So I think that, you know, young people see right through you. They don't hear what you say. They see what you do. And I think that um, that speaks volumes. Um, also, Adrian for the kids wants to know, what are your plans for the future? Well, Adrian... Um, Adrian for the kids is his Instagram, um, and he's really committed to doing work in the schools and with youth. And my goal in the new year in 2020 is to get a new group together that um, that I can guide into doing assemblies nationally and internationally. So I would say that Adrian's going to be on the team. I'm working on getting a budget for him now, so if anyone wants to donate to AIM, I want to earmark funding for him. There's a young man named Leo underscore Brian. He's on Instagram. He used to be in my unit in Juvenile Hall. Incredible talent. Um, I'd love to see him with Adrian on the road touring, making a difference to young people and, and continuing the work. There's... Um, a young man named Maserati E and Banks who just came out of San Quentin. They did a lot of time, and they came right out and hit the ground run. They're doing assemblies and really important work. I want to connect Adrian to Maserati and Banks. If you don't know who they are, you should go on my Instagram and follow them. They're really doing important work, and it's a continuation of the work that I did with Tupac. It's their own. And they're also doing the music and the soundtrack for Just Mercy from Brian Stevenson's book. It's going to be a really important film. Um, so, yeah, to answer Adrian's question, <laughs> that's, um, that's what I'd like to do in 2020 is to help organize all these young people to continue the work. Because I'm getting tired of running all over the planet. I literally was driving like a crazy person because I had Rolling Loud Festival with NotCal, who I also don't manage. And NotCal's really dope, if you guys don't know who he is. Um, he starred in the movie Mid-90s. He's a pro skater and an actor, and his music is out now. He's one of the newer young people I manage. 
And if you don't know Fauna, um, F-A-N-A-H-U-E-S, Hughes, Fauna Hughes, go check Fauna out. She's another brilliant young talent that grew up in my workshop. And um, she has a video out called Icarus. Dope, dope talent. You know, some of the new folks I'm supporting and dealing with. I have to, and so this is the time in the interview, uh, Layla, that um, I give the opportunity for the individual that comes on my show a chance to give shout-outs to whomever they want to give shout-outs to. Um, also, there's social media handles and any websites that uh, you would like to let our listeners know, so that way they can check you out and follow you if they're not already doing that. So my Instagram is Layla underscore Steinberg. Um, the best way to access me is Instagram um, or the website at Aim for the Heart. Thank you for doing the work. So uh, if I could shout out anybody, I definitely want to shout you out. I think that you're pursuing your passion. You're using your voice to share, shed light on people and stories. I think that's really important. Um, and, you know, I love Tupac. I work with him every day. He might not be here in body, but his spirit is so strong. And, you know, Ray Love, who is like a son, brother also, just like Pac, he, um, he's a, an incredible person that Pac loved dearly. And, you know, he's still out here doing his thing. And, we transition and change. Sometimes we go from the stage to running business. And, you know, I think that you could learn a lot from the elders. We throw our elders away, which really sucks. And um, I think we need to take the time and, and listen and learn from our elders. There's a young man named Kelly Smooth. Um, he's JP to me, but he's... Um, He's another young person who grew up in my workshop who's incredible, has an incredible voice, and he's also working with youth and doing his thing. And, um, I just, I think that any time we have an opportunity to use our voice and touch people, I think it's important that we do that. I want to say, Layla, thank you so much for coming up on Outlaw Radio Live. Um, it was an amazing opportunity. And um, I know you probably hear it a lot because you work with a lot of people, but uh, it, I have really meant a lot you messaging me back and you coming on my platform. I've been a huge Tupac fan my entire life. Um, Tupac's music actually saved my life at one point. Um, so just being able to talk to his mentor and his first manager and have you on my show is, is a really, really much of a blessing, so thank you. Can you tell us before I get off how listening to him saved your life? Um, sure. Uh, so when I was younger, I grew up in foster homes and group homes. Um, never really had a relationship very much with my parents. Um, so when I was 13 years old, I'm now 25, but when I was 13, um, I was getting bullied at home and at school. I couldn't escape it. I wanted to kill myself. So what I did was, um, I didn't tell anybody what I was going to do. I stole a knife. From the group home group home's cupboard i went upstairs barricaded my door shut and i turned on my radio um i did it so that way if i screamed no one could hear me if i wanted to back out couldn't get help i really wanted to end it that day at this point i never knew who tupac was i uh, never heard his music at this point i had a very very sheltered childhood um i turned on the radio and i heard the dj go we are going to be taking it old school here's tupac changes and um, I had the knife literally in my arm. I was about to go right up around the vein. And for some reason, when I heard his very first verse, when he goes, I wake up in the morning and I ask myself, is life worth living? Should I blast myself? I don't know what came over me. I just didn't want to do it anymore. I pulled the knife out of my arm, wrapped my arm up, hid the knife, and I just went downstairs and told him that I fell and tripped and cut my arm. But ever since that day, I felt that if I didn't feel that hear that song come on the radio, I deep down don't think I'd be here today. So, so I, I think really... that's the most important thing out of the whole interview. It's why I take calls. I 
promise you there are so many kids in the world who after every dark night there's a brighter day um like he has saved so many lives and that's the power of music and i think that i don't know if you shared that before but i think that's so important and your testimony is crucial and um I think that his impact was global, and it goes beyond, like, age and race and gender, and um, he's a spiritual teacher, and and so, I mean, that makes me so glad I did the interview that you told me that, because I know that, that he's that powerful, so that was really motivating, I'm, I'm super glad you shared that. I'm going to be honest, to answer your question, I never shared that live on my show before, so that was the first time, but I have told, like, friends, family, because people ask me, why are you such a huge Tupac fan? Like, I listen to other kind of mu- other kinds of music, obviously, as well, but I have, like, all his movies, all of his CDs, posters, and whatnot, because I feel that, you know, contributing to his legacy... You know what I mean? He helped save my life, so what am I going to do? You know what I mean? Unfortunately, I, I can't shake the man's hand. I can't personally tell him thank you. So I could help play his music on my show. I can buy his merch. At least that way his family is still getting money, you know? Well, it's so great to hear that. I think that was the most important thing of the interview. It was, yeah. I actually have two Tupac tattoos as well. I got, um, well, you're familiar, obviously, with the Tupac Resurrection movie. Um, you know how, like, he wrote his name on the cover? I actually have Mm -hmm. that tattooed on my chest, above my heart. God, I guess we both have our Tupac dedication tattoos. (laughs) Yeah. I was was never going to get a tattoo, but I have a big mural on my body that definitely is, um, Tupac-inspired, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) I feel you. Well, gosh, I hope somebody got something out of this today I never know I hope I touch somebody somehow because everybody matters every life is important and there's always as long as you're still breathing the possibility of healing and I um I only want to share if I can motivate or inspire someone so hopefully I did hopefully I um I was what you wanted and um appreciate you um i appreciate you as well that interview this interview was amazing um once the interview is uh once the broadcast is over i'll be sure to send you the youtube link and the spotify links and whatnot that way you can re-listen to it as well right on thank you you're most certainly welcome have yourself a wonderful night and um got a merry christmas to you and your family you too bye sweetie thank you bye-bye